How's it going, Carl? What's shaking, man? Hey, Rob. Doing pretty good. How about yourself? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. Carl Van Camelbeek. He was um, uh, last episode's guest with uh, with his uh, lovely wife Megan, and he's here with me because we are going to talk about something uh, that's not really talked about in in the world of sports. We're both sports aficionados um we we follow so many things we were messaging each other when we should be focusing on other things about sports, <laughs> sports topics <laughs> that's that's happening around the world and um one thing we want to talk touch on today is how vocabulary is how important that is for an athlete in today's day and age when it comes to uh when it comes to performing on the field, on the ice rink, on the court, or whatever, whatever sport, like we got so much, so many sports we can talk about. Um, but first off, like you want, you want to figure out what, you know, what, what, what words stand out to you when it comes to an athlete, Carl? Like, what, what, oh, like, that's a good like, question. Yeah, what well, words? I mean, there's a lot of characteristics, right? Grit, toughness. Uh, you can get into the athletic words like agility, strength, confidence, uh, mental acuity, like all, all sorts of words, um, because really the words are, are what like makes us operate on, on, a, on a certain level where the, the images that we have in our head when we're picturing like that game winning free throw or whatever, it's just like the words we made up into our into our mind essentially like we wouldn't know what pictures are if we didn't have the words in our mind to to communicate what that picture is right we don't really think about that when you hear the term uh, a picture like a picture could mean a thousand words yeah well you need to know the words to to recognize the picture <laughs> absolutely yeah and and for for every athlete that goes into the into the pros, it's it's a career. And like every career, you are a walking dictionary for that for that profession. You know, like you're if you're a doctor, you know all the vocabulary terms for medicine. Uh, if you're a football player, you know everything, all the terminology when it comes to being being an athlete on the field in whatever position you're at. If you do not know those proper terms, you're you're lost. You 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 are not gonna you're not going to succeed. You know, I guess somebody yeah. came to you, Carl, and say, you know what? Um, I want you to play right wing, you know, on, 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 on the Los Angeles Kings, just argument sake. And you don't know what, like you probably played hockey. Okay. You got the height. You, I'm sure you have, you're Canadian. Right? I've got a good one for you, Rob, actually like a really good example. I see where you're going with it. Like I played some flag. I'm not saying I'm anything special or uh, even at collegiate level, but I played a little bit of rec football in my day for sure i'm still young but um like i'm a pretty good raw athlete all-around athlete athletic uh, good hand eye all that stuff so football came pretty natural to me but once i joined the league not having any background in it whatsoever play wide receiver i get told to write uh i get told to run like a skinny post just like skinny post once once the snap hits and i'm like i have no idea what that means i line up i just start running I just run like a straight line, man. The cubic chucks the ball. And it's like, you know, almost a pick. And it's just like I'm getting screamed at and stuff. It just goes to show, like, if you don't know the, the vocabulary of the terms, like you need to know that stuff because you can completely destroy the game. It's an interesting uh, analogy that, that that you brought up there because a lot of people don't realize what goes into making a play um for, for certain teams. You call it a skinny post, but how that play actually comes together you got to go behind the scenes so you have to go in in the locker room you have to sit down with the coach with the position coach offensive coordinators you got to put all the position players up on the on the whiteboard and that's when the all that terminology comes out nickel corner post um dime formation uh three down technique uh all these different things if you if you're not following if you don't know it if you don't know it you're done. You're you're going to be ride, riding the bench. You're going to be riding whatever. Okay, right. so that's what a lot of people don't see, and that's what that's what I want to talk about on, on on this episode is what people don't see. Like we watch sports on TV. We're the armchair quarter, quarterbacks. We sit back and it's like, ah, I could do better. I can do this. I can do that. Here's an example. You see a baseball player. 
Hits a fly ball, bases loaded. He has an opportunity to get some uh, get some RBIs. Hits a fly ball, it flies out. He goes to the bench, slams the bat on his knee, breaks it in half. Starts throwing things in the dugout, pushing his own players. And as, as a fan, what 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 are what are you watching there? Like what what do you what do you see? Somebody who's not emotionally stable. Yeah, okay. yeah, the body language. Exactly, body language sells it all. That's why watching games in person is huge because you, you, you don't necessarily see those things on TV if the camera is not aiming on it, but especially in basketball where you're so close and live to the action. It's like what that player, his body language is walking back to the bench. It's like LeBron James is like a super emotional player in terms of this guy plays with his heart on his sleeve. And it's, right. it's clear if like they're losing the game. Like five, five on five, one player means a lot in basketball, especially a guy like LeBron James. If they're down 10 points and his body language in the third quarter is that like he's sitting at the end of the bench eating popcorn and doesn't want to be seen with the rest of his teammates, you know he's checked up. You know they're not winning the game. That's huge. You might not see it on TV, but in person, you're like, yeah, I might as well go home because the Lakers aren't winning this one, right? I mean, it's, it's huge. So for somebody who's emotionally unstable, as a teammate or a coach, it should be their responsibility to go to their teammate and support him, right? Make sure, don't worry about it. It's okay. You come back and you're here for a reason. You're a professional for a reason. Everybody's going everybody's to mess up. Yeah. Nobody's perfect when it comes to sports. Like, come on. Teammates are great for that, but it ultimately comes down to the individual, right? So, like, as an individual, you got to take on that responsibility. Because you look at an example like Antonio Brown and the meltdown that happened in New York, <laughs> it's like Mike Evans was that guy. You know, he tried talking him down, but ultimately, like, it's AB's decision to, uh, to take the utmost responsibility, whether he's in the wrong or, or, or uh, Bruce Arians is in the wrong on that one. Like, shouldn't, shouldn't get to that point, right? should be able to stable enough to talk to each other like men and move forward. Yeah. There's, there, there's a lot of things that can contribute to the way he reacted. It could have been some, that CTE issue it could be concussion issues. Like he's had some problems for the last few years. And you think, you know, being with Tom Brady would kind of sit you on the, on the straight and narrow, but I apparently not. I don't I think his career is done. I think it's finished to be honest um move on from him like he's 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 history <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't take that guy um so if you had to pick a sport man um which one do you think would be the most taxing mentally on uh, on an athlete man i could be so many could be so many right answers on that but personally you that? what are you sorry sorry i'm gonna give you my thought before no, 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 no. I'll, 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 I'll throw a couple at you. It might my top two. I'm kind of torn. I want to say golf for sure and, and UFC. Golf and UFC because golf, I mean, like it's so easy to mess up. You can screw up your day so easily. And then UFC, if you do mess up, then you're going to screw your life up. So like there's a lot you can say. There's a bunch of uh, mental and, and all the major sports like football, hockey, and all that. But I'd say there's a million mistakes that happen in those and you can still win the game. Whereas golf, like, you know, well, you can even go as far as chess or darts or bowling. I don't know where you're going to want to go with it. Oh, you that sports? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> because it's on ESPN. does not do that as an athletic sport. <laughs> hey, man. Dart. <laughs> hey, man. Have you ever tried to hit a triple 20? It's not easy. <laughs> No, I'll admit it's not easy. It, it's difficult, but <laughs> I don't know. Playing poker is a sport. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm scratching my head on that one too. <laughs> but um, yeah, you, you, I agree with you with the golf one. That was that was the one that I was going to say because those guys, they say golf is a mental game. You know, right. those guys are and and girls, they're away from their families, they're away from their spouses for pretty much eighty percent of of the calendar year. Right, they're on tour every every week, pretty much, um, competing in a tournament, and I think they get like one, maybe two, maybe two days off. 
you know, they finish on a Sunday if they make the cut on uh, on uh, Saturday. They have Monday off, travel Tuesday. Got to do a couple of practice rounds, and then you're in the tournament for Thursday. If you're doing that every right. single week. Can you imagine what that what kind of toll that would take on not just your your mental health but your your physical body as well. And if yeah. you mess up, I I'm a golfer. I, I I know like when I'm on my game, it's great. You know, it's awesome, and then it just takes one slice, and that's it. I go I go in the shitter. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know. So yeah, I agree with you. Golf is is huge when it comes to mental toughness um and and ufc as well you know like you you, you got to know you got to understand a lot of things you got to know your opponent you got to know what to do what to expect you know you're going to get hit you know what kind of, what are you thinking in that moment you could break something uh you saw Conor Man. McGregor's uh was his ankle or was his uh, what is was it his leg that he broke yeah it was his leg and you got the coaches and the corners yelling at you you got the opposing yeah. coach you got fans screaming at you. It's a brutal sport. You're throwing fates out there, fakes, faints, all sorts of movement. Your footwork, you got to be moving moving back, pressing the guy. There's so much that goes into it. It's like a game of chess. Meanwhile, you know, you, you're under a certain time limit and everyone wants to see that finish. If you guys don't rough each other up as much as the fans like, they start booing, like, there's, there's some showmanship that's got to go on. There's a lot of technique that goes into it. And meanwhile, they're scared for their life. A lot of them will admit it. They get super nervous before the fight. They get super scared. Who wants to, who voluntarily goes in and, and risks their, especially their life? No one's died in the UFC, thank God. But like to get knocked out cold and not know where you are and wake up in a, an arena full of 20,000 people, you got to be like a brave uh, SOB to step in that ring and then golf. I mean, you got your caddy talking to you, giving you suggestions. Ultimately, you make the decision, though. You got the slope, the pitch on the green putting, the putt game, the long game, all these different types of game. The fans are a little more respectful, but you might have Tiger, whoever, just playing little mental tricks on you, talking to you while you're <laughs> while you're uh, about to putt or, like, when you're approaching a new hole. Like, there's all these little subtle things. Same thing with tennis, man. I don't really think it's tennis, but tennis is huge, too. Um, just the amount of like the duration, the length of the game. They play for hours on hours on hours, and like a couple break points here, and you're back in the game. Ah, oh, it's uh, it's nuts. But when you're fatigued, that's when that's when it comes out the most. You got to be mentally strong when you're fatigued. And yeah, it's a lot of repetition. Like Tiger Woods, if you watch this documentary, like he's been doing it for a long time. His dad was like on him like a military like a soldier like always on him. and i think and i think that's that's one thing to, to to bring up is the 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 pressure that a lot of these athletes are put under by their parents um, right at a young age as well you know like a, a lot like i i've been in florida for the last uh four months and i've talked to a lot of people who have you know, put the kids through sports and everything. And the competition at, at a young age is remarkable. And the pressures that come with that is, yeah. is I didn't, I, I have not had that when I was little to see it, to see it now in, in person is, is, is remarkable. So what, what do you think can like these like youths today, what can they do to, to get themselves ready and try to try to ignore that 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 talk that outside talk and let them focus on themselves and focus on what's in front of them no, that's a good question um i mean we we both use a tool that's really good for the mental game right called techno tutor yeah to reprogram your your conscious and subconscious unconscious the three levels of the mind and that's what it comes down to at the end of the day, right, these guys are doing it unconsciously, like to, to be doing those jabs and those fakes and those feints in the UFC, like they're only thinking about so many things, but the footwork's going and their, their heart, their heart's beating and they're breathing, like taking deep breaths and stuff while doing all this stuff. They're not even thinking about it because the repetition and 
the mental games that their coaches play with them. So it's like you can program that into you through repetition, or you can do it through this tool that we have that is basically a cheat code, right? Um, even in, in, in any type of sport, you name the sport, like I can give you an example, right? But uh, it's, it, it's a cheat code for sure. And to be able to do these things unconsciously at a high level, that's what every athlete wants. So let's let's use an athlete um, for an example. Before we started recording, you were mentioning one, Ben Simmons, a NBA, right. NBA player. Um, give a little give a little bit of a background as to his situation with uh, the 76ers and where he is now, and uh, what he has not done um, in the in the last little bit for anybody who's not aware. Yeah, yeah. So Simmons like an interesting case. He's in a lot of. Uh... He's in a lot of the headlines right now, right? Because of the big trade with James Harden to Brooklyn. Um, essentially what happened with Simmons is he was always like a high level athlete, very um, gifted in his athleticism. And he's like six, nine lengthy, the, the prototypical NBA star. He's got all the attributes. He spent the classic one semester in college, right? Didn't go to class just went to college for the basketball uh, for the one and done type of deal. So he didn't really learn anything there. Went to a very prestigious university at LSU. Um, didn't make it very far with them. Never really worked on his game too, too much. And again, I'm not a professional athlete. Who knows? He, he could have, he must have spent tons of hours in the gym, but compared to other players, that's where it's questionable, right? Because you can see it in his mental where he's at the point he's in the playoffs last year against the Hawks. He's underneath the basket. He's 6'10". He could just go up for a layup or, or go for a dunk. Scared to do it because, you know, he doesn't want to get fouled. Why? Because he hasn't worked on his craft at the free throw line enough. He's not confident enough to take those free throws in a high pressure situation. He knows he'll miss them. So instead of taking an easy layup and, possibly getting fouled, he's passing out the ball to someone who's on the wing who's got a tougher shot to take when he could have easily just went up for the two points or earned them at the free throw strike, right? So things like that, that's like a huge downside for someone who's at an NBA level and these guys are getting paid, this guy's getting paid $35, $40 million a year to be reliable in those situations. And when you have a guy who's unwilling to to go for the easy two on offense. You're basically playing four on five in the playoffs. Right. And it's to the degree where he sat out all of this year because he's not happy with the team and how the situation was handled. And now even he's healthy, he refuses to play. It's all mental at this point. And he's always been refusing to shoot three pointers, which is a huge part of the game now. Almost everyone shoots three pointers. doesn't matter how tall they are. And, uh, I mean, you, what could he have done? You know, it's just focused more on the mental. He's got all the God-given talents, athletic athleticism-wise. He's one of the, the best defenders in the league. He knows what he's doing on defense when, you know, the attention's still on him. He's got to lock up the best player on the other team. But for some reason, it just doesn't click on offense when, it's, when push comes to shove. So right. you've got to get that unconscious confidence at the free throw line and just a shooting stroke because you watch him warm up you watch him in practice these buckets man he swishes it it's all mental though you put him in front of the crowd and people are chanting and it's time to rise up and then he, he just shrugs shrugs away from the, the moment you you kind of wonder you know kind of you do wonder you know why why that is somebody of his his stature you know his with his athletic ability is all of a sudden scared and nervous on a, on a large stage to not perform, you know, kind of, you kind of want to think where did that start? Maybe that started in his youth growing up being yeah. pressured by his parents. And he was afraid to disappoint his parents that if he did, that he would be reprimanded. He would have gotten in trouble, yelled at or something like that. You know, so he did what he did to appease to appease them. And then when it gets to a larger, you know, larger scale with, you know, 17,000 fans 
wanting you to make that bucket, you get nervous, like, oh my God, if I mess up, I'm fucked. <laughs> you know, there's right. 50,000 people angry at me. You know, so you, you got to look at kind of where, where, where it all started. Yeah, you're, you're an athlete and all that, but where at, at some point it, it, it began, there's like this kind of mental, um, mental, uh, I'm trying to find the, the right word here. Speaking of vocabulary. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mental issue came, came in, you know, that unconsciously you're, you're running these, you're running these programs. Right. You know, not... I was just going to say like, there's this one quote by um, Bill Belichick. Okay. Right. Yeah. You know, everybody knows big bad Bill, you know, the Patriots uh, uh, head coach. One of his uh, famous quotes he said is, to live in the past is to die in the present. Mm, that's a good one. You, 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 you sit back and you say that one to yourself a few times. And we all do this. We all like, we're all programmed at a young age. And those programs have molded us into who we are today. And if it's, if we're not who you, we truly are, it's because of those programs at a young age. And I think that's what happened with Ben Simmons. I think those yeah, programs at a young age, have molded him to who he is today. And these unconscious programs are starting to come out now. Yeah. And he's got the, like a little backstory on him is that his father, Dave Simmons is an Australian professional. He was a former Australian professional basketball player as well. Right. So it's like his dad was a pro big shoes to fill. Yeah. Even if he didn't play in the NBA, that's where that, that program comes from the environment. Like, his dad's always on the road growing up, all this stuff. Like how much was his dad actually in his life? And when he was around, what was the, the topic of discussion? Always ball, right? It's just living with these guys. We talked about a bit um, before going on, like these guys are always on the road. They got maybe one day off a week. And most of those guys still use that day to work out and perfect their craft. Because let's be honest, like, to do that at the level they're doing it they're hitting like 80 90 like for, let's stay on the topic of basketball they're hitting like 80 90 percent of their shots in practice so that they're able to hit like 50 to 60 percent of their shots in real game time situation and that's just the reality it's just like the pace gets quicker the intensity gets higher and the the, the the limit for errors gets smaller and smaller so it's like these guys are playing at game speed you have these six foot ten seven footers throwing their hands up at you when you're shooting like in practice you don't have any of that you can hit those shots no problem so it's like practicing that in game speed and to have the motivation and the willingness the determination to do that every day of the week pretty much even on your one day off during the week it's it's taxing big shoes to fill exactly um so how how can we help athletes today avoid these kind of situations in 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 the future let them become emotionally stable let them help them become confident to you know perform on that ultimate stage you know it starts at a young age yeah we talked about it or you touched on earlier you know, you and I both have a tool called Techno Tutor. How it helps you de-energize certain words that you know have affected you throughout your life, right? And if you can do that at a at a young age to understand what that word what the word is, to take that energy off of that word to be like like it, it will not affect you it would take you to that next level right yeah that emotional charge for sure um hey your, your programs run deep you know as much as you don't want to admit it like you're not going to be like your mother you're not going to be like your father it's like you okay. are you definitely are because those programs run deep and unless we bring this technology to the, the younger generations the future generations are going to make up our world our leagues the future of these leagues that that's where it starts right it starts in the schools and the academies all those all those places like we need to make it mainstream so 
so that coaches and get to the point where the coaches have used the technologies themselves, right? So it just gets keeps getting passed down because right now at the stage where like the athletes using it, but the coaches don't understand the impact of it yet because they didn't have this technology um, when when they were playing the sport because most coaches are guys who have been part of the sport or were athletes at, at one point in their life. So imagine once the newer generation uses this technology, perfects themselves, and then they become the coaches and they could pass that on to the newer generation. It's like you're going to be at a whole other level. Yeah, communication is key in, in, in all aspects and not just sports, but in all aspects of, uh, of daily life. And like you said, if we can get, if this was in the hands of coaches, in the hands of parents, in the hands of, of, of kids and, and schools, like the world is, is their oyster. The ability to communicate, to understand these things is, is, is remarkable. You know, like I was, before I, I, I got into this, I was, um, I was an athletic scout. And there was a lot of terminology that I had to learn in order to understand the world of football scouting. Yeah. And like any profession, right? Exactly. Exactly. And it, it, it's remarkable because I was writing scouting reports and I'm like, holy shit, there's all these different kinds of words. I, I had no idea. And, I, and gradually I started understanding. I started learning them. Like this was before I had Technotutor, right? I can only imagine if I had that tool with me, how much faster I would integrate those words into my, into my vocabulary and understanding things. And there's two things that I understood that it, how an athlete learns. There's physical learning, there's audible learning. And audible learning is essentially, you know, ones that are good listeners. And now if that coach has that good ability to communicate on what he wants that athlete to do on the field or rink or court, whatever he's doing, man, that athlete can go to the next level. And to do that for today's youth at a young age, man, <laughs> it's right. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's like Carl and I, you and I can talk these people's ears off for the next couple of hours about how Technotutor works. And if anybody's into, like, I don't want to get into it into the nitty gritty because it'll take, like I said, it'll take a while. But if there's anybody interested that wants to know more, reach out to myself. Reach out to Carl. Ask us a couple questions. We'll we'll gladly help you out. No problem. I'll we'll be uh, glad to show you. Right, your eyes don't deceive you. Exactly. 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 <laughs> Um, what, one thing I want to talk about now also, Carl, is, um, I, I saw this article. I gotta, I, I want to read a little bit, a little bit to you. It's, it was from the Northern Kentucky Tribune. Don't ask me how I found it. I would not think I would be looking at a Northern Kentucky article. Um, but it was an article written and published on February 6th of this year by uh, Richard Innes, and he is an education analyst for the Bluegrass Institute for Public Policy Solutions. I'm just looking at my screen right now, and I'm just going to try to read you a little bit of tidbits of information here. And he was saying that Kentucky has a serious problem with its public education system. Um, it's not the matter of what they're being taught, you know, with the school shutdowns, the critical race theory, the, all the masking issues that's going on. It's actually that the high numbers of bluegrass state students aren't being taught to read at anything close to an acceptable level. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, <laughs> what your, your first thought, just, just hearing that, what, what's your first thought on that? Well, how, how do you uh, become successful in 2022 and beyond if you can't read? period right like you could maybe just maybe make it to the professional level that's already a slim chance whether you can read or not obviously having the ability to read is going to help you significantly let's say you even break that 0 0.0001 percent chance because people have done it in the past right uh, old hockey players co coaches even nhl coaches I didn't even know how to read, were able to coach, but mm -hmm. times have changed. But then beyond that, what are they supposed to do? Let's say they, they have enough 
they've, they've memorized enough of the, the vocabulary for the sports, but they can't even read. So what are they supposed to do after sports? So that's always the greatest question, right? For all the people who make, make it to the pros, even the ones who make it to the pros, only the top like 5% of those guys actually make enough money to, to live off of for the rest of their life. So the rest of these guys have to find a broadcasting job after or something because all, all they know is sports. And it was a huge issue in the 2000s. And you'd think that the league is getting better at it, but it starts at the education system. So if they, people can't even read, how are they, how is the league supposed to help them even if they do make it? Like they don't even know how to read uh, basic charts, financing, like for that, like financial planners that the league provides them and stuff like they're screwed. Right, it was screwed. The same thing in Phoenix it was like very disgusting statistics that like if they're not able to read by a certain level by the fourth grade, that's kind of like a watershed year. They're building prisons out in Arizona based on how like the reading levels in grade four. So that's how like translatable it is from reading levels to their probability of ending up in jail at a later age in life. Because what else are they going to do? They don't make it as an athlete. They can't read. They're going to do what they know, which is probably some illegal stuff or whatever they were introduced right. to by their environment, right? So. Perfect segue to the next part of this article I want to read to you. Awesome, man. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he, uh, Ennis goes on to say, he goes, Kentucky's reading problem is significant. So based on a 2019 results from um, – now they call it a national assessment of education progress. Uh, he estimates that at least 64,000 students just in kindergarten to grade three are essentially very weak to non-readers. And across the entire kindergarten to grade 12, well, 200,000 Bluegrass State students lack even a partial mastery of reading. That's a whole lot of kids to exit the school system to become a major burden in adult life for both themselves and for all of society. So what you just said, Carl, is exactly what he wrote in this article here. How these kids yeah. moving forward, not being able to read, not being able to understand, not being able to comprehend what they're reading, they are setting themselves up for failure down the road. That's a scary thought. And that's just in Kentucky. Picture this on a global scale. That's yeah. not good. That is not good. Um, so he was, he was asking what's going on, and he says that many Kentucky teachers, okay, teachers, they haven't been properly prepared to teach reading in accordance with what science shows works best, neither in their education school programs nor in follow-on professional development. What the hell is that all about? I read that article. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I could not believe it. I know the irony of reading. Uh, <laughs> How long have you been doing this, Rob? Man, that, the, the, that, that problem runs deep. I mean, we, we know that reading isn't done properly whatsoever. The phonetic way of reading, the A is for Apple, and the A, B, C, D, E, F, G song, you know, the alphabet song is all wrong. To, to teach a kid the fundamentals of language through a song is insane. I'm 25 years old. And I still have to think about sometimes what comes after L. Let me sing the song real quick. You know, what comes after G? <laughs> I'll, I'll, like, what, how effective is that? I shouldn't have to take a couple seconds to think about that. Should just be integrated right away. Now it is, but uh, like that's how it was for the longest time. You know, that translates to everything, whether it's like counting cash, whether you're a cashier, that type of stuff, like low-paying jobs you get what you you put in basically. So if you're low vocabulary, you're gonna have a low paying job. Yeah. Point blank. And, and like I said, that, that that's just in Kentucky. I got I have seen it in, in other schools. And and what 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 kids are not being taught today is are are things that do not set them up for success in the future. Okay. I wish I was taught how mortgages work, how to invest, um, real estate, um, entrepreneurship, running a business, all those kind of kinds of things. 
I wish I was taught those things back in school. Because God knows where I would have been, you know. Who knows yeah. how the program? I would have been a completely different person, you know. But I had to follow curriculum, being told what I had to learn instead of what I wanted to learn. Yeah, you know? yeah. And that's what I'm I'm seeing in my kids. You know, we homeschool Kiara McKenzie. You know, they're uh, at the time of this recording, they're they're eight and five, and we we use Techno Tutor with them. And we have already seen a huge leap in their understanding of vocabulary, the way they're reading, what they're what what they're understanding. And like Kiara, you you saw her in uh, in Orlando. She yeah. was she was selling bracelets, and she was saying how she wanted to start her own business. Yeah, what eight year old wants to start their own business? Uh, Jordan Belfort's, uh, the Grant Cardones, like the billionaires of this planet, pretty much, right? We, Give you an idea. Yeah, exactly. Like we are seeing them thrive. They are asking questions. They're being kids. They're being open minded, free thinkers. That's what they're doing right now. And they're using Techno Tutor to support their development. And what we see is happening with them is phenomenal. Physically witnessing it is it, it, it's remarkable. Imagine that yeah. on a full scale. <laughs> you know, like yeah, you teach them how to think instead of what to think, right? Imagine if everyone had the basic knowledge of how the mind works and where our thoughts come from and how like the possibilities are endless instead of that negative mindset of I need to think about sciences and history and geography and the only things I learned in high school and what did that textbook say oh shoot I gotta go back and memorize it again so I could spit it back out on the test tomorrow and then forget about it and then graduate and not know where I want to go in life because I just learned a bunch of subjects I don't really care about because they taught me what to think and not how to think right it's it's a it's a revolving door but it's like how do you if you are a system if you are a wealthy person and you need to create a system to keep people down and working for you, what better way than putting them in publicly funded schools where they learn what you want them to learn, which is the absolute basics of crap you don't really need to know. <laughs> <laughs> the lowest levels, you know. And um, we've all we've all pretty much been through it unless you've had wealthy parents who, who know better and weren't raised in that environment going back to the sports thing now uh, i know there's a little bit of a segue there about about kids and it's important it all it all ties together you know we're talking yeah. about sports and how the, how they were brought up and how they were essentially trained at a young age to, to play that sport what what sports did you play i know you said you, you played uh black football but when you came down to fort area to visit us at one time you were Pretty much tell me you played everything. What was your like number one? Yeah, start off with soccer. That was the first thing I fell in love with and played at like a pretty high level. And then as soon as I got my growth spurt, I turned into basketball in high school because I went from five six to like six three in a matter of a couple of years. And then I got into a little bit of softball, recreational softball like football as you mentioned you know ping pong with the the lads in high school ping pong table growing up tennis in the summers golf i didn't really get into too much that's going to be more of a retirement sport i think <laughs> but yeah tennis ping pong soccer football softball hockey grew up with a rink two minutes away from my house so it was pretty great skater never you know there's only so many clubs you can join school also and working dead beat jobs and whatnot so uh, a little bit of everything honestly you give me a ball or puck or stick or whatever the sport i'll play i'm just not the best swimmer i guess i'm all around i can swim but i wouldn't be playing like water uh polo or something like that <laughs> i can imagine the the injuries that you sustain in the uh in a lot of these sports and i want to tell people a story when you came down to visit us you and i were playing <laughs> football around okay and i threw a ball i didn't think anything of it it didn't 
I didn't feel like I just rifle it at you. <laughs> you come up to me nonchalantly. Oh, my finger's dislocated. What was my reaction? Oh my God. <laughs> what the hell? Are you okay? Here's this. Here's this guy. Nah, it's okay. Let's put it back in place. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The worst part, that was, that was the first time I'd done that myself. But uh, the adrenaline took over. <laughs> <laughs> I did not want to go to the hospital, right? But luckily, I, I don't know. Luckily, I was able to put it back in place and I haven't had a problem with it since. But no, um, I mean, luckily enough, I didn't play any contact sports. I stayed away from rugby. I was really pushed to play rugby in high school. That was the main sport. And I'm glad I didn't because a lot of my close friends suffered a ton of concussions, which long-term benefit like risk or short-term benefit is huge like the fact that the teachers were pushing that so hard on us to be to join the rugby team and incentivizing us with these cool trips and stuff is crazy when you think of like man I know people like five plus concussions you know in a matter of a couple years like it's insane for what so you know we win like the Eastern Ontario or Ontario championship type thing, you get a plaque on the wall and then you're, you're, you lost, I don't know how many brain cells. And I've seen people get their noses broken, you know, rib cage popped out, um, like collarbone dislocated, just like injury after injury. I, I've, been, I've been pretty lucky with the injuries, just sprained ankles, dislocated fingers, you know, sore backs and stuff. But Luckily, I didn't pursue it to like a high enough level where it's like destroyed my life. Because you look at some of these UFC fighters in particular, and these guys like Shad and Michael Bisping. I've been listening to a lot of him on the Joe Rogan podcast. And yeah, shattered orbital bones, blind in one eye, like two artificial knees. Like you name it, man. Like these people are painting a great picture for any of their today's youth watching this that want to play sports. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty the fighter i mean yeah you rugby players and ufc fighters you gotta be a, a different built from a different cloth to even want to attempt that, right like it's sad to say what's going on right now with ukraine and russia like these people are are we're going to be born into war and they were the younger kids who are have to fight for their country and stuff like what do you think they're going to grow up wanting to do they're like there's going to be so many fighters and things of that nature that are going to come out of this a lot of the the good fighters in, in the ufc right now are from russia and dagestan these small countries that have been in war and conflict for years they're amazing fighters but it's not a, again it's like what are the odds that they make it and then after that what are they doing all they know their whole life is fight how to fight and, and conflict and whatnot everyone's just fighting for survival we got to change that absolutely and that's what these people are being programmed uh, uh over there this is what they see on a, on a day on a daily basis you know like like you said we got to change that and we have been and we will go further absolutely yeah um, next generation that's right thursday thought how's that going it's going good. Uh, we're recording this on a Wednesday, so definitely gonna have to film one uh, soon, either later tonight or tomorrow. But we're on what 15 weeks now, so yeah, I'm going on 15 weeks of straight consistency, no weeks missed. That was a big fear of mine. Just doing this in general, doing these types of recordings, like it's amazing. Some of the stuff I've been able to accomplish with with Techno Tutor or TT, as we like to call it for short just because of these fears and these barriers just getting broken. Like I was so camera shy before. Now we were, I, we recorded a, a radio show with you that we put live on air. That was crazy. All these personal things came up for that. Just walk through, it was an awesome show. You did it. I would be, I'd be willing to talk to like 10, anyone, <laughs> fill a room with 10,000 people. I'll, I'll talk to them right now. Like I wouldn't have been able to tell you that a year ago, right? It's a uh, huge for confidence and self-esteem. And that's exactly what these athletes and <laughs> let's not kid ourselves. Everyone needs more confidence and self-esteem 
because it just gets beaten out of us real quick. So I'm regaining a lot of that using yeah. TT. Yeah, I'll put uh, Carl's link to his uh, Thursday thoughts in the in the description below. Uh, anybody uh, who uh, would like to hear some uh, little nuggets, uh, gold nuggets of information, go uh, go check him out. Um, yeah, man. built for the current generation who's got small attention span. You know, quick two minute videos. Stay gold <laughs> and uh, yeah, definitely. If you can post oh, a YouTube oh. channel, that'd be appreciated. No, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. And, hey, you know what? I appreciate you coming on here talking about I want sports, man. It's it's it's, uh, it's one of the things that uh, you and I uh, love a lot of. Um, yeah, more the NFL football kind of guy. And you know I, 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 I I mentioned this before we started recording about remember Kirk Cousins. I, I was mentioning to you. I want to yeah. say, like everybody, you know, football player, they're not smart. And I was like, no, 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 no. Football players are smart. You have to be smart. You have to have that, that football acumen. You have to understand the terminology, the vocabulary to get to where they are. And they can get further if, you know, you understand more terminology. But um, I'm just trying to find uh, my page. I got like 15 pages open here right now in front of me. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, here we go. Okay, so yeah, Kirk Cousins, he's a quarterback for the Minnesota Vikings. Um, so according to a site called Word Tips, he is he possesses the largest vocabulary of any athlete across the NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball. So in order to come to that conclusion, Word Tips, they, they analyzed uh, these transcripts from interviews and press conferences from uh, athletes across those three sports, and they determined who uses the most unique words. So based on their analysis, out of every 500 words, Cousins, um, he had 348 that were unique. And that put him just ahead the uh, Yankees pitcher, Garrett Cole. Jared Cole, uh, he had 347 by one. And Houston okay. Tech, and Texans quarterback, Tyrod Taylor, 346 uh, for uh, every 500. Isn't that something? That's interesting, man. I was going to ask you how reliable is that test to actually how do they figure that out? Because I've done some vocabulary tests in the past, I don't really know how uh, reliable those are. But in, uh, um, is Jalen Brown on that list in the NBA at all? Do you see him anywhere on that list? Uh, I did not go that in depth to see who were who were the others. They I uh, just got the top three. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah, because that's what I was gonna say too. Is like um, the sports vocabulary is huge, but like if you've got just a robust vocabulary in general. You look at a guy like Jalen Brown, like he's it could have been a Harvard, uh, a Harvard student. Like he got accepted to Harvard, ended up going to Cal, I think. Um, but like guys like that, like you hear him speak. I don't know how many interviews he does, but like I would be surprised if if he wasn't up there because like they call him the president in the NBA because he speaks like a president. <laughs> and like there's those types of guys that like they're doing it right because he knows it's not all about the NBA, even though he's a very good NBA player, I'm certain he's going to have a great career in whatever he does afterwards, just because he's very well educated, and uh, there's tons of those guys, there's tons of them who realize also that they're their own brand, and they got to market themselves while they're hot, and that that's a certain level of stability, but then after that, what happens? So the people are starting to figure out more and more that they're their own brands, but now it's you know bringing that to after they retire like how can they sustain that so even after they retire they're still relevant yeah exactly and there, there's life after athletics and a lot of these guys are are setting themselves up for that you know yeah and uh just going back to cousins uh quickly i was looking at his stats for the last couple of seasons he doesn't get a lot of love. Even I don't give him a lot of love just because maybe he's just on the wrong team. I don't know. But the guy last season had 33 touchdowns to seven interceptions. The year before that, 35 touchdowns to 13 interceptions. That's just two, that's just two seasons. The year before that was where am I? Yeah, 26 touchdowns, six interceptions. So the guy yeah. is performing on the field. So I think you can see there there's going to be there is some correlation there when it comes to understanding vocabulary 
to performance on the field. He understands it at a higher level, at a higher rate than a lot of other quarterbacks in the league do. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a leader. I'm pretty sure like the guys in the locker room respect him. He gets paid as if he's a very good quarterback too. A lot of people I think get give him a lot of flack because he gets paid as if he's a top 10 QB and maybe the stats don't back it up, but it's also he hasn't really made any deep playoff runs either. But he's definitely a high level uh QB in the league for sure. I would take him over, you know, uh, half of the other starters in the league so it's yeah. huge I mean you can tell he's definitely a smart guy he's definitely has the respect of his peers in the locker room funny guy and like you said his interviews are good so, family man yeah give the guy a chance and uh yeah he'll he'll, he'll do well I mean, he well, checks off a lot of boxes for sure absolutely all right man that's uh that's it we're uh we're over the a lot of time uh <laughs> <laughs> No, it was, it was awesome. I appreciate you uh, coming on again and uh, and just talking about sports and uh, Ted and Tudor and hopefully we inspired some some people to to make the changes to to open their minds and think and feel free to ask questions. You know, we're curious about wanting to make the proper changes, positive changes, to make a world that's best for for them, best for everybody. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what it's all about. The new, the new one percent, but overall uh, equality and uh, making sure everyone's basic needs are met. That's that's what we're we're here to do. That, I know that's our mission, you and I. I don't think there's any greater mission, and it starts with education. Fundamental. It's not a fun word. It's not a big buzzword, but I'll tell you when it's done right, it's there's nothing better. That will be our savior. <laughs> and one more question. What is the proper definition of education? And education, every, every word you can spell, spell process, and comprehend. Process and comprehend. Okay, I, I had it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, every, yeah, every word they can spell, process, and comprehend, your comprehend, your process. Yeah. That's, it's uh, huge. That's a proper education. All right, man. You take care. You take care of Megan. You take care of those kitty cats that you got uh, over overpowering you in the, in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. how, how are the Bengals doing? Good. Nothing. There's more more of them than us, and they're gonna about to multiply. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, no, they weren't. They weren't. Uh, they gave me bad luck with the Bengals beating the Chiefs, but they, they <laughs> didn't buy enough for the Bengals to win the Super Bowl. So I guess. Yeah, you can blame me, Cincinnati. You know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, to live in the past is to die in the present. Remember exactly. the words from Big Bill. <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. And right. uh, yeah, we can't we can't uh, leave without saying uh, Rob's future is looking brighter than ever. He's got he's got a Hall of Famer QB. This is Wilson's coming to town. Uh, so I'm, a, I'm, a, to I'm a Denver Bronco fan. We finally got a quarterback. Um, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm yeah. Happy. I'll have a lot of heated, uh, looking forward to having a lot of heated text exchanges in the future. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, I just want to get to a goddamn game again. I miss going to those <laughs> games. And I think uh, a trip to Denver would be would be in order um, <laughs> for, for, for you and I. Where it will be Mile high. Yeah. It'll be wicked. <laughs> a little fun getaway. That'll be awesome. All right, Sounds Matt. Good. You take care. Yep. Thank you, everybody out there. Tune in for the next episode. That'll be down soon. See ya. Right on. See ya.